24th, 2001, Officer Sean Devlin, Narcotics Strike Force, was working the morning shift. Undercover surveillance. The neighborhood? Tough as a $3 steak. Devlin knew. Five years on the beat, nine months with the strike force. He'd made 15, 20 drug busts in the neighborhood. Devlin spotted him. A lone man on the corner. Another approached. Quick exchange of words. Cash handed over. Small objects handed back. Each man then quickly on his own way. Devlin knew the guy wasn't buying bus tokens. He radioed a description. An officer, Stein, picked up the buyer. Sure enough, three bags of crack in the guy's pocket. Head downtown and book him. Just another day at the office. Well, that was not a recent case from the Federal Circuits uh, of Appeal, but that was a denial, a dissent from a denial of sorciory by none other than Chief Justice John Roberts, uh, issued back in 2008. I was reminded of that description of the uh, case that uh, Judge Rob Roberts was talking about there um, from a case we'll be talking about this week here on Short Circuit, your podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeals. I'm your host, Anthony Sanders, director of the Center for Judicial Engagement at the Institute for Justice. Today, I have two powerhouse IJ attorneys with me to talk uh, about these two cases. One of them from the Sixth Circuit, where Judge Sutton uh, went in a different direction than it seemed like Ju uh, Justice Roberts uh, meant to do in that case, if the if the case had been taken. Um, although different frac facts and uh, different doctrine involved, but uh, the, the cop on the beat aspect of it remind me of that earlier case. And talking about that Sixth Circuit case later in the show will be Will Aronin. So Will, welcome back to Short Circuit. Thanks so much for having me and I really love your, your uh, cop voice. Well, um, I never read any uh, still haven't Mickey Spillane, but uh, except for that take on, uh, which I'm pretty sure it was a take on Mickey Spillane by uh, by Justice Roberts, and um, I always uh, I try to use that voice um, when, when, whenever I can. Um, and Rob Johnson is joining us too. Now Rob is going to talk about a very different issue. Uh, we're not talking about cops on the beat, but um, in a sense, judges on the beat, and when you can sue them. Usually you can't, but every now and then uh, a judge does something so outrageous that you actually um, can pierce that veil. So uh, Rob was involved in this case. Uh, IJ was an amicus in the case, and it was actually argued by our former colleague, uh, Tori Clark, um, at oral argument as an amicus. Uh, the decision came out a few weeks ago, and we were we at IJ were very happy with the result. So it's from the Eighth Circuit, uh, written by uh, Judge Strauss. And so, Rob, can you tell us the story of Rocket v. Amy? Is that right? I think so. Yes. Not not right. the normal uh, uh, girl's name, my wife's name, Amy, but um, I think it is pronounced Amy. Yeah, it's spelled E-I-G-H-M-Y, which, you know, I think I, if I recall correctly at argument, everyone was saying Amy. So, you know, we'll go with that. Um, yeah, so, you know, as you, as you said, this is a case about judicial immunity, which, you know, everybody I'm sure who listens is familiar with the concept of qualified immunity. And judicial immunity is like the, uh, it's basically like qualified immunity on steroids, the really, really good kinds of steroids. Yeah, very. Like way yeah. above Barry Bonds. This is like Lance Armstrong steroids. <laughs> like, you're definitely winning the Tour de France on these steroids. Um, <clears throat> so uh, basic rule, you cannot sue judges for anything. But as you said, sometimes there are things that are so bad that you can. And this is, in fact, one of those cases. Um, it's a custody dispute between two parents. And the parents were initially married in the state of Missouri. Then they got divorced and they actually moved together after they got divorced to the state of California so that they could pursue their ch children's career in the entertainment industry. And it actually turns out that the children 
were successful. Unlike most people who moved to California, they actually were successful in pursuing their dreams of success in the entertainment business. They became magicians. Uh, and they rose to national prominence appearing on the show, America's Got Talent. And this matters. It's not just sort of an interesting aside, although it is that. Uh, it matters because the judge who is assigned to this custody dispute uh, in Missouri after the mother sues for custody of the children in Missouri, uh, the judge who's assigned to the case doesn't like that these children are living what he believes to be the Hollywood lifestyle. And he actually thinks they should come home to Missouri and be good little Missouri children, uh, not doing California type things. So uh, this all comes to a head. There is a custody hearing where the judge assigns custody for the following month to the mother uh, and then tells the children after the month is up, they're going to have to go back to their father. And the children react negatively to this decision. They want to stay with the father. And in the hallway, they are heard loudly complaining about the judge's decision. And at this point, to be clear, nobody has asked the judge to do anything. The children aren't in the courtroom. Uh, they're just in the hallway. There's no motion pending in front of the judge. And in fact, the judge has taken off his robes. He's come down from the bench. He's just an ordinary guy, effectively. But he walks into the hallway and he decides he is going to deal with this situation. So he takes the kids into a conference room where he tells them that they have to give up the Hollywood life and come back to Missouri and be normal kids. And they continue to protest his decision, saying they want to stay with their dad. They don't want to go with the mother. And so he tells them, I'm going to show you what I can do. And then he personally takes them down to the jail cells in the, in, the, in the courtroom or the courthouse. And there he has them take off their shoes. He books them into the cell. And he holds them there for over an hour until finally they agree to go off with their mother. And that's the first time that the judge has these children jailed. It is not the last time. The next time he has them jailed, we fast forward to the year 2020 in the midst of the pandemic, and the mother again has filed a uh, motion seeking custody of the children, and the judge orders a hearing. And at the advice of their lawyers, the father and the kids don't show up. They do, show, they do send the lawyer, uh, but the lawyer tells them, you don't need to come because you don't live in Missouri anymore. You have no connection to Missouri at this point. And so there's no reason that you need to travel to Missouri in the midst of the pandemic to be there in person for this hearing. But the judge doesn't like that. And he issues what is called a pickup order for the children, which is basically an order telling the police to arrest these children. And again, nobody has asked him to do this. There's no motion pending. Nobody has said, please arrest my children. The judge just takes it on himself to order this to happen. The order then gets forwarded to the police in Louisiana who execute the order and they arrest these two children and hold them in jail for over two days in the midst of the COVID pandemic in Louisiana. Finally, the dad's able to get them out and he turns around and he sues this judge for twice arresting his children without any legal basis. This then comes up to the Eighth Circuit on the issue of uh, judicial immunity. And the court issues a decision saying that at least in part, this judge is not immune. Now the court begins by giving a sort of interesting discussion of the history of judicial immunity. A lot of it drawn from the Institute for Justice amicus brief. And what the judge essentially explains is, or the court essentially explains is, well, you know, the whole origins of this doctrine were that it, back in the you know, twilight of history, um, if you didn't like a judge's decision, there was no way to appeal. The whole idea of appeals hadn't been invented yet. So instead, what you would do is you would challenge the judge to a duel. And if you <laughs> won the duel, not only would the decision be overturned, but the judge would no longer be a judge. <laughs> and would lose their ability to be a judge forever. <laughs> so this was how 
things were settled in the olden days. And but they decided that that was not a good system. So <laughs> instead, they invented the whole idea of appeals. And the idea of judicial immunity was, you know, you can't challenge judges to duel, to duels anymore. Instead, you have to appeal, which, you know, that makes sense. Uh, but that doesn't mean that judges should be immune for literally everything that they do. Uh, instead, there are two important exceptions to this idea of judicial immunity. Now, the first is that judges are not immune for, quote unquote, non-judicial acts. So, you know, if a judge robs a bank, you don't get to say, well, sure, I robbed a bank, but I'm also a judge. You can't get me. No, that doesn't work. You can be liable for that. And then the other is things that where the judge is doing something judicial, but there's a complete absence of jurisdiction. So, you know, judges have to have jurisdiction over the case in front of them. If they just clearly, obviously lack jurisdiction, they can be held liable for that as well. So having laid that groundwork, the Eighth Circuit then turns to this facts of this particular case. Uh, and it draws a line between the two arrests. And it says, as to the first arrest, the judge was not acting as a judge. You know, there was no motion to arrest these kids. The kids weren't even in the courtroom. The judge arrested them personally. He didn't order someone to arrest them. He just walked, walked in, arrested the kids, put them in jail. And in the words of the court, judges are not jailers, right? So the court says, no immunity for that. So far, so good. But then an interesting thing does happen. The court says, well, as to the second arrest, there the judge was acting as a judge. Uh, the court says that, you know, basically the judge issued an order. He sort of wrapped it up in the formalities of what judges do. And so that looks enough like what judges do that he is, it is a judicial act. And the court says, well, he did have jurisdiction because Missouri courts are courts of general jurisdiction and basically have jurisdiction over everything. So he is immune. And, you know, I think I think you're right. You said that we we like this decision and we do. Right. I think the judicial immunity is so broad that even the first part of this is is great. It's a major victory. But at the same time, there's also something a little weird about the decision where you have a judge, you know, he arrest these children both times without any request from the parents and without any legal authority to actually have them arrested. But if he does it himself, he is liable. But if he just issues this completely illegal order and asks the Louisiana police to do it instead, well, now he's off the hook. Um, you know, is that the right result? I'm not sure. Uh, and actually, you know, it's interesting. The judge, the, the Eighth Circuit gives a few examples of cases where you might not have judicial immunity. And some of these look a lot like the sort of second instance here. So the, the court gives us an example where you wouldn't have immunity. They say, you know, a judge can order lawyers in a case brought before them by the bailiffs, but a judge can't order the, the lawyers to be beaten with nightsticks along the way. Uh, and the Eighth Circuit says a judge can order a search warrant, but a judge can't uh, spontaneously order a search warrant for the house of their neighbor. And the Eighth Circuit also gives an example of a case where a judge was held liable for having a coffee vendor arrested by the courtroom bailiffs because the courtroom vendor, the coffee vendor sold the judge putrid coffee. <laughs> real case, real case. Um, I mean, have and you ever like, had putrid coffee? It really is a horrible offense. I mean, it is a terrible thing. It is a terrible thing. But, uh, you know, I, I, to me, this case is not that different from the putrid coffee case, right? Like he had these kids arrested in Louisiana without any motion from anybody asking him to do this, without any legal authority for it. And especially in the context of the first arrest, I think the second arrest really is not that different from the putrid coffee case. So you know, it is a good decision, but at the same time, it's a split decision. The second part, I think, is highly debatable and very troubling, right? Like it, if a judge can just have you arrested so long as they dress it up in, a, in an order, even if that order is totally illegal, I'm not sure that, you know, we want to live in that world. It's a world where you better not piss off a judge, but that is the world we live in. And at least at least the judge is not totally immune. Will, have you ever been sent to, to jail by a judge who wasn't wearing robes? 
were they wearing robes? No, <laughs> that, I have I have never been sent to jail by a judge. Um, I have had a judge in the middle of a homicide trial threaten to hold me in contempt, but afterwards we all laughed about it. Um, <laughs> so I have never actually had it done. But if you had gone to jail uh, for contempt, I'm I'm guessing there would be no remedy, even if it was absolutely outrageous what the judge uh, uh, was doing to you. I didn't say it was outrageous. He may have been warranted. Um, okay. No, it, there would not have been any. There would not have been any remedy. Um, I, I agree with Rob. It is clearly a split decision. I was a little surprised. The idea of this judge just disliking these, this, the father and these children that much that he sent them to jail for two days. It, it, the fact pattern is so outrageous that after reading it. I don't know how much more legal analysis I did as much as just Googling, finding out how is this judge still on the bench and it appears that he still is. The like, judicial ethics counts haven't really gone through if there are any. It's just amazing the, the degree with which this judge was able to hurt this family and con- just commit heinous acts. And, and the consequences, thankfully, are beginning to come, but too slow. Well, that is people sort of put that out there as like the justification for absolute immunity. They say, oh, well, you'll be held accountable in some other way. Like you'll be, you know, if you're elected, you won't be reelected. If you're appointed, you'll be impeached um, or there'll be some sort of ethics complaint. But it turns out in practice, none of that is meaningful, right? Like often, you know, you're not going to get impeached for political reasons or because it's just too hard. You're not going to get unelected because it turns out sometimes voters like judges who do ridiculous things. Uh, just like they like politicians who do ridiculous things. And ethics, you know, you're basically asking other judges to hold their peers accountable, and that's not always going to happen. I mean, it's it's def- that's definitely true with prosecutorial immunity, who uh, get absolute immunity when they are acting as prosecutors, and it's a little bit more of a hazy line there, but it, it's similar. Um, and And I know a lot of work has been done on, you know, the worst that almost ever happens to a prosecutor is some kind of inform or formal, but but n- not meaningful slap on the wrist. Um, and j- judges, I would imagine, it's even worse. <laughs> Other oh, than yes. the rare judge who who you know doesn't win election because of because of some uh, reelection because of some scandal. Uh, yeah, I I am similarly torn as you guys on uh, on the good and the bad in. In this case, I mean that the so the you know the arrest warrant, the second one, where the the only actual arrest warrant that you know that would obviously be a candidate for mandamus review, which is very hard to get. But I can't see how it wouldn't be granted in this case, where no one's even asked for the arrest warrant and it's out of state and and you know pandemic, all the other reasons you give. I guess. You know, to get to play a little bit of devil's advocate, I guess the reason for the doctrine as it is in this case is that it it is so uh, it can be so gray what the difference is between you know a, a judge just acting uh, in a way that would be reversed on appeal uh, or even by mandamus, and then a judge acting outside of the lines. It's just so gray that it's it's like you put the robe on, you take the robe off. That's how we're going to look at it. Um, is that a fair way to, to summarize it, Rob? Because I, I mean, of course, there are hypotheticals you can come up with where the judge has a robe on and, and is doing, you know, is acting outside of the box. But um, I guess they just they, they're going to err on the side of immunity. Yeah, well, so I think that's the problem, right? It, it can't possibly just come down to the robe. And that's like the the coffee example is such a good one, right? Like if the judge, the judge in the coffee example, he's wearing his his robes and he actually, I mean, the the facts are just incredible. The judge actually orders the bailiffs to go out on the street, arrest this hot dog vendor. And he specifically (laughs) says, you have to bring him into my courtroom in, in handcuffs. So the deputies handcuff the vendor and the vendor is like, please, could you not handcuff me? And they're like, no, no, we've got to handcuff you. So they walk him to the courtroom. Um, all the people in the courthouse are like yelling to each other. They arrested the hot dog man <laughs> and they bring him into the courtroom. They have a court reporter and the judge proceeds to basically interrogate the the coffee, the guy about his coffee and, you know, saying that the coffee's putrid. The vendor's like, no, it's not. Um, he then lets him go. 
But then when the coffee vendor comes back that afternoon, the judge has him arrested again and brought into his courtroom a second time. But like, you know, he's wearing robes. There's a court reporter. There's like all of the formalities are being observed. And yet it's just completely illegitimate and not a legitimate exercise of judicial power. You have to draw that line somewhere, right? And I, I think with the second arrest, the things that to me kind of put it on the other side of that line are, first off, I think you have to view the two together, right? Like you have a pattern here. Right. Second, there's no motion to arrest the kids. I think that's a very important fact, right? Like it's not like the mom said, hey, please arrest my kids. And the judge was like, oh, okay, fine, I'll arrest your kids. Like there's no motion. He just decides to do this by himself. And then the other thing is there's actually just no legal authority to do this. Like there's a statute that says when you can issue pickup orders, there has to be like a petition for juvenile delinquency. There is no petition for juvenile delinquency. The judge just like decides to do this, even though it's just legally not allowed. And like, sure. Yeah. Like there's, you don't want every bad judicial decision to turn into a lawsuit against the judge. Like that's why we have appeals instead. But in this case, like there was a mandamus petition, it was granted, uh, but that takes time. And like in the two intervening days, these two kids are sitting in jail in Louisiana in the middle of a pandemic. And there has to be some recourse for that. It's just amazing to the mindset of the how these kids being in Hollywood is so bad for them that I'd rather throw them in jail for days uh, against the parents' wishes for the crime of not wanting to live life the way the judge wants to. Like this is some of the worst like fact pattern I think I've read in a while. I I got a closing question, which is uh, you talked, Rob, about the history of. Um, having a duel with a judge and then they invented appeals. And I, I get that that was true, that the, the, there's this fascinating footnote, footnote one in the opinion um, where Judge Strauss re- recounts some of this stuff and um, uh, you know, cites the history books and it, it talks about it, uh, the law at the time of Henry the second, which was in the, the mid 1100s. Um, but you know, they, it's not like appeals didn't exist before that. Um, I think there were in some ways, you know, courts of appeals in the, the court of Constantinople and, uh, and, and elsewhere. So uh, I, it doesn't seem like a very self-sustainable practice. Do you know anything more that, about that history? This is really a different podcast, I guess, but I would, <laughs> I would love to dig into a little bit. I mean, I know about duels when it came to litigation or when it came to criminal law. But um, I, I actually didn't really know about duels when it came to appeals. I, you know, I wish I knew more, I, but it, I don't know a ton. I do know that in England, a lot of this also was that, you know, if you're familiar with the history, of, there was the different types of courts in England. So you had the king's right. bench, obviously, but then you also had the ecclesiastical courts. Uh, yeah. You had the common law courts, which are like sort of the same as the king's bench, but maybe sort of different. And then you have like, the local lord can be a court. Yeah, I didn't. This yeah, is not well, I think there were the county courts. Like, yeah, and at some point, the county courts were kind of developed. That the king's bench was developed as a kind of appeal of the county courts for cases that came from the countryside, not from that were filed in London. And I'm guessing maybe this was early on, uh, maybe after the Norman Conquest, when things were kind of all over the place, they, they the county courts would just kind of have this dual thing. <laughs> so I think in addition to the duels, though, a lot of this with judicial immunity, a lot of it was basically they were establishing the hierarchy of the different judges. And so actually in England, like they didn't, not every judge had judicial immunity. And so basically if you had judicial immunity, that made you like an appellate court. But if you didn't have it, then like you could be appealed by filing a lawsuit challenging your decision. I see. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. More sense. I just love I love how you two can talk about the history of the different level of courts off the top of your head. And I am literally sitting here thinking about the duels and just imagining the mountain from Game of Thrones being the greatest judge <laughs> ever because no one could ever appeal his battles. Like it just our minds work very, very differently. Well, they do mention in the decision that you you didn't have to do the duel yourself. You you could have a champion. <laughs> yeah, a champion. So this actually is like Game of Thrones adjacent, mm. right? So like because in the in Game of Thrones, right, the mountain is not he's like someone's champion, I think, in the in the duel. So very similar, actually. Prince Oprah and Martell. That's what I'm taking on that one. 
Well, if I had a champion, uh, I'm sure it would be one of, be one of you two. I, I think you could probably choose better. <laughs> well, that's all I got right now. Um, so we're we're going to move on to another champion, um, and this is um, this is a beat cop in um, in uh, Lansing. So not a, not a huge town, but uh, a town home maybe of, with home some of problems. the greatest point guard ever. We don't we don't need to get into that, um, but uh, where there's a, a a a cop who was on the beat who uh, noticed something suspicious. I have to say I would be a little suspicious of this too. And then what led from it? So, will uh, what was going on for uh, for this man, Jeron Morgan, um, and why was he sleeping in his car? Um. So the case is U.S. v. Morgan, and it's a case authored by a Judge Sutton out of the Sixth Circuit. Um, why he is sleeping in his car is an, is a question that the court, the officer, and the defendant all have very, very different answers to. But I really like this case because it touches on two issues that are sort of near and dear to my heart, both uh, suppression in criminal cases and just the Fourth Amendment's uh, community caretaking doctrine. Um, it's also just an interesting decision because although I, I do like the general holding, I, I have some mixed feelings about the factual analysis. So here's largely what happened. So just a, an officer is responding to just a completely unrelated non-emergency call uh, at 5 a.m. on a residential street. Someone is snowed in. Um, their car is snowed in. I'm not actually sure why that's a police issue, but the police went out, I guess, helped the guy on the way to this, like, residential street, the officer sees someone asleep in a running car at 5 a.m. on sort of an isolated street. So the car, the cop sees that and sort of considers it suspicious, but he goes, he helps the snowed in civilian, takes about 10, I think the decision said, 11 minutes. And as he is, as the officer is leaving the street, he still sees that the person is asleep at, at the wheel at this moving um, uh, uh, this running car. So basically the officer is thinking to himself or, or according to the community care doctrine, caretaking doctrine is saying, well, this, the person could be intoxicated. They could have been in the middle of a DUI. They could be asleep. They could also just need help. So the cop goes up to the car and generally nobody really thinks that this is inappropriate. The cop saw something suspicious or in, with this doctrine there, something that, that the officer thought he needed to, to look into and help. That's all fine. So typically what you imagine is what the cop is going to do is knock on the door, on the window, shine in the flashlight. That's not exactly what the officer does. So the officer, rather than knocking on the door, he actually just opens the car door and asks Morgan, are you okay? And this is where the facts become, they're, they're not overly contested. The decision specifically notes that the um, that the officer turned on his body cam. Um, so it seems to, it suggests that the, the fact pattern is pretty supported by the camera footage. Um, so the, the defendant, Morgan, responded to, are you okay, pretty groggily. He would seem to maybe intoxicated. Um, the officer asked him to get out of the car. There is a scuffle, like some disagreement. The decision said Morgan hits his own head on the um, steering wheel, which seems a little weird. Um, in any event, the officer says he sees the defendant reaching for a cardboard box on the, uh, on the passenger seat, on the passenger side. Um, the cop says he thought it was a gun, grabs him, there's a fight, other officers are brought in, the person is, and Morgan is arrested. Incident to the arrest, they search the car and they find, I actually went back to the briefs for the, the detailed facts, but it was about somewhere between 25 to 30 grams of meth, fentanyl, cocaine, and heroin. And I, I think maybe most tellingly, there actually was uh, a gun specifically in that cardboard box on the uh, on the passenger side. Now, I will tell you, uh, my background is criminal defense, so I always look at these facts somewhat skeptically. But uh, going back to the briefs and the fact that they talk about the body cam and the fact that everything was found, it, it probably went down mostly the way the cop is saying it did. Um, but then it goes to a suppression motion. And Morgan moves to suppress, basically saying that the search was unreasonable. Now, the 
basically the the argument was it was unreasonable because it was a community caretaking doctrine. Now, community caretaking, caretaking is designed instead of for criminal investigations, the idea that police are allowed to do non-investigatory steps. They can deal with public safety. They can look into dangerous situations. They can deal with illegally parked cars, things like that. And if it happens to be that while they're dealing with it, they see evidence of a crime that that uh, is an exception to the to the warrant requirement. So the Morgan says that while they may have been able to look into it, it was entirely unreasonable to simply open the car door and not just do the less invasive steps what the, uh, of knocking on the door or shining a flashlight, what have you. The officer says that he that in his experience, startled people, if you knock on the door when they're intoxicated, might just push the gas and slam slam on the gas and drive through. And he had just and he mentioned that he had just helped a civilian basically on the same street, and um, that he was afraid that the car that the um, the driver might actually hurt someone. Fair enough. The off the is it, is it though? <laughs> well, that, that's sort of the second takeaway. It is it, the best question is why are you startled when someone when someone like knocks on the window but not opens the door well, it's sort of questionable it just like presumes that he's like sleeping with the car in gear but his foot on the brake so that it's not moving he, that that's why i kind of like the general what? holding so let, let's it, talk about what the holding is well, wait, really was quickly. it i hadn't even thought of that was it an automatic or, or manual or does it even say oh i think i saw the car I, my guess is it's automatic just from the stats, but that would be really funny if it wasn't. I mean, but um, even if it's an automatic, like this presumes the car is in drive, right? Yeah, like, the car wouldn't be in drive if it's an automatic. There's no way. No, it, it completely right. And that's why ultimately <laughs> we're skipping ahead a little bit. <laughs> the, court does, the court does suppress the evidence and it talks about the community caretaking doctrine, what it was for. Sutton goes into quite a, a bit of history of the doctrine, going back, talking about the the non criminal investigatory, non criminal aspects that um, police have done throughout history, um, and ultimately the the court says that community caretaking would have allowed the officer to investigate, but they have to it, the, any actions have to be reasonable, and essentially that because there were less invasive ways for the cops to investigate, knocking on the door, essentially opening it was. Um, Opening the door was unreasonable and therefore it was suppressed. And I will say, interestingly enough, the Morgan pled guilty and actually took 17 years, but preserved his right to appeal um, the suppression issue, making this decision essentially an all or nothing. So he either was going to get 17 years for this or zero, which which is actually pretty typical in criminal cases. It's just, it's an interesting, uh, interesting like gamble type of thing. Um, there are sort of two takeaways that I find really fascinating about this case. The first is just, it's nice to see the continuing narrowing of the community caretaking doctrine in general, and especially in the context of cars. Um, Rob and I are actually co-counsel on a case um, in, in Delaware involving uh, the, way car, uh, the way town sees impound and tow and ultimately scrapped cars. Um, and the court largely justifies it, or rather the city largely justifies their actions based on the community caretaking doctrine. And largely what, what some cases have said is anything dealing with uh, cars allows cops to do to investigate because they are mobile and they can be moved, they can be seized, et cetera. So it's nice to see um, some sort of narrowing because listeners here probably remember that in 2021, the Supreme Court in uh, a case called Caniglia actually cast doubt on the doctrine, especially when it can't, comes to people's houses, and it's just nice to see it's expanding. Um, I will say the other second thing that caught my eye, though, was discuss when when Rob, when you and Anthony were joking about, is it reasonable to think that startled people just drive, drive off? What the court talks about is that the c officer just made this assertion that it's entirely that like that in their experience, startled people drive what might push the gas. And the court noted that there was no support for that, that the, the, the police, the officers, the, the prosecutor didn't introduce any evidence, didn't introduce any expert evidence, any empirical data, anything whatsoever to say that this assertion or this training is, is real. And if what this case means is that at suppression hearings, cops can't just go in and say like, in my experience, 
criminal defendants or suspects are suspicious for one of a thousand different reasons. And if courts actually hold them to a level of proof and say, there has to be some basis, show me the training, show me the data, where are you getting that? This decision can actually have a, a, a pretty important impact of slowing down just officers kind of like later on post hoc rationale for why they basically grab someone and search them. That's That could be the biggest takeaway, at least to me. Yeah, so my reaction to this case, you know, it, I've always sort of felt like in the area of the Fourth Amendment, like we have these doctrines that just if, if police officers come on the stand and they say the right things like, oh, I was just trying to help or I was just worried for my safety or I was worried for someone else's safety. that We have these doctrines that it's like magic word doctrines that just then let officers off the hook. And the weird incentive that that creates is that it, it creates an incentive for officers to lie to get evidence on into court. And basically it's like, if you just lie and say that you were worried about someone's safety or you were there to do one thing when you were really there to do another, that courts will just accept that. And it's very pernicious for um, obviously the judicial system to have, you know, to just sort of like accept lies and not, and not critically examine them. But it's also, I think, been really bad for the whole profession of policing where you have like a generation of police officers and not to disparage anyone. Right. But like there's, it creates this idea that like part of your job as a police officer is to lie on the stand. And that's not good for the, the profession of policing. It's certainly not good for the courts. And it is nice to see judges push back against that. Yeah. I, Completely agree with uh, with both of your takes on that. The um, the interesting thing to me was, uh, well, one of the interesting things was that if the if the cop had you know given a different justification, I could see this going uh, a different a different way. Such as this guy is passed out in the morning um, with the car running, and so there's a really good chance he's intoxicated. And so I'm going to, um, you know, use that as a, a, a excuse for a search. Um, I, you know, I don't want to, don't need to do the analysis of that's going to work, but it seems like it would go in a different direction maybe than the, um, than the community caretaking direction. Um, I was really fascinated by the, the history that uh, Judge Sutton gave uh, about uh, community uh, caretaking. One, one thought, and this is a, a, a very different angle, but one thought I had about that, and Will, I'd be curious if you have a thought, and this is really leaving it for another day, is, um, right, we've been talking a lot the last few years about how cops do, do, do too many things. And I am very sympathetic to that argument, right? So cops uh, are do all these welfare checks. They do all these things that you don't need a guy with a gun to do, and that can escalate situations. And, you know, this was a huge... Uh, conversation after the George Floyd uh, murder and and in all kinds of other ways, but um, I, this also shows like this fact pattern shows that it it would be a little hard in some ways to extricate cops from that role because cops just kind of land up doing a lot of that stuff in their normal crime fighting. So what this what this then demonstrates is that if the police are going to do less community caretaking type things, um, which I think they should do, I'm very sympathetic, as I said, to that, um, sometimes it's going to be hard for that to happen because this officer was doing, um, you know, a call that was uh, within his purview as like, you know, patrolling. And then he sees this, he sees a guy in a car He's calling it, you know, kind of his community caretaker hat. He's checking on the guy. But what is he supposed to do? Call a social worker to come down and check on the guy when he's already there on the street? You know, that's not going to be very efficient. And so he goes and does that. But then at the same time, he, of course, has his cop hat on and it things escalate very quickly. And he goes back into being a cop. So uh, it would be, it's complicated to try to remove police from this other role. And, and of course, this is a very controversial issue, but it just shows how uh, there's, there's not a lot of, there's often not a lot of bright lines in having, 
you know, what police do as crime fighters and then what police do in other ways that we think maybe other agents of the state should or even of civil society should be involved with. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm here for that argument. Um, I, I'm really sympathetic to the idea that we, there are police are doing too many things and just welfare checks can escalate and have escalated in a way that maybe we don't want to involve law enforcement, that there may be better solutions to that. Um, it actually, I feel like it ties, what you just said ties in a lot of the themes from this decision and what Rob said. And in, it's funny that Coniglia is the case that na- that sort of cast out on the community caretaking doctrine as a whole. And then Coniglia sort of ends, or, or maybe it was a concurrence by Roberts, I want to say, um, talks about how there wasn't um, – like, it was specifically because the government decided to rely exclusively on the community caretaking doctrine that it just didn't work and that there really were other excuses or other rationales, rather, for why the police could have acted could have acted. And going back to the way you open this, um, the way you open this podcast about like the, uh, the, the narrator from the film noir, like honestly, what the cop did was pretty good policing. He saw something that was really suspicious in a neighborhood and it was either realistically, either a drunk driver, or he probably had some suspicion that there was drug dealing involved. And suppression always has to be decided absent like w- f- while ignoring what you actually find. But let's be honest, this guy had a gun, was probably reaching for it and had 30 grams of drugs on him. So the cop did a good job. And if he didn't have to rely on like the community caretaking doctrine as a whole and sort of get him like bury himself into this weird cul-de-sac of, of legal arguments, he could have really said, look, this was super suspicious. I'm very concerned about it and actually investigate the criminal activity and not have to talk about how it was really fit, how everything really fit within the community caretaking doctrine. So hopefully like uh, casting doubt on that doctrine as a whole might na- might eliminate some of the problems we keep seeing. Sure. I, I got to jump in, though. I don't agree. I'd really disagree. So like the judge, the, the officer made a couple big mistakes, right? Like, sure. Yeah, this looks suspicious, maybe. But first off, I don't agree that it's either drunk driving or drug dealing because like there are just people who sleep in their cars. Like that is a thing that happens. Like sometimes people don't have a place to stay because they're homeless or like they were kicked out of the house by their spouse or like who knows but they sleep in their cars like that doesn't necessarily it's not necessarily suspicious or maybe there was a big blizzard he was driving home and he just like didn't want to drive in the snow so he slept in his car i don't know but i don't think that like is itself inherently suspicious second off and this to me is like the main thing he didn't have to open the door of the car he could have just knocked on the window. And that's why the whole discussion we had earlier about whether the like this this idea that this officer gives on the stand of like, oh yeah, like I was worried that like <laughs> that the car was going to accelerate off if I woke him up by tapping on the window. It's just ludicrous. And the police officer definitely did not have to open the door. Right. And that's what made it more too intrusive. That was where he went wrong. Like he should have just knocked on the window. I completely agree with that. I think it's the, the the fact we're even using this community caretaker, like it's a thing, right, that allows this argument to be made kind of just unnecessarily muddies the waters. Um, I, I think my point is more whether you have this doctrine or not, cops do this kind of, you know, non-crime fighting thing, which he probably wasn't doing here. <laughs> But does they do do in other cases, and so do, uh, that's unfortunately there's got some gray areas um, on what is and what what isn't. I think the doctrine doesn't help because then the doctrine allows for these searches that aren't crime fighting searches that aren't uh, under the Fourth Amendment, and therefore cops want to be community caretakers and not crime fighters when they're actually really crime fighters. Yeah, and it. <sighs> This goes back to what you were saying, Rob, about just like the testa lying, going on the stand and just making things up. If he didn't have to fit what he what the officer did into the community caretaking doctrine, I'd actually taking off my criminal defense hat. I'd actually be really interested to have the officer just explain very like detailed why he was really suspicious of this car in particular and not fit it into the doctrine. Because, again, like 
outside. I'm not defending the guy. He had a gun and 30 grams of individually wrapped drugs. So like there probably was something more than just he's sleeping in his car. Um, and I would much rather have the officer get on the stand subject to cross-examination and actually explain the thought process, go through some of the training, go through what it was that he observed at that specific time, and then again, subject to cross-examination, learn it. But because there's this loophole of, or I don't know if I want to call the whole community caretaking doctrine a loophole, but like there is this very broad doctrine that sort of sl- swallows up the entirety of the probable cause or the warrant exception or requirement. Like I'd, I just don't want to keep hearing officers get on the stand and explain how they were really just trying to help when honestly what they saw was someone they believed to be a criminal and probably had probable cause to believe it. And now let's actually question the probable cause on subject cross-examination. That's what a suppression hearing is supposed to look like, and it often doesn't. And that would be a huge thing to come out of this case if we could get – if we could go back to what the hearing is supposed to be. Well, thank you both. Um, I'm going to go back to thinking about um, the last time I slept in a car and how I would have uh, – I didn't think I had the uh, uh, the, the engine running, uh, luckily, um, and how I might respond uh, to something like that. And in the meantime, I hope our listeners uh, think it through too, and, and I hope they've enjoyed our uh, our two guests here today. Thank you both for coming on. That was uh, that was excellent. These were two really fun cases. We'll look forward uh, to our listeners coming back next time, where we're going to be having a special guest. Uh, I hope you uh, will enjoy our our next show. Don't want to give too much away at, at the moment, but we'll have a special guest next week. But in the meantime. I hope that all of you enjoyed our uh, Independence Day a couple days ago from when we recorded this. But in the meantime, in the future, I hope that all of you get engaged. Mm-hmm.